I have no disclosures. Again, so the first talk, um, it's really about uh, coagulation in pregnancy. First, we're going to uh, get a brief overview of the changes of coagulation during pregnancy. Uh, look at a variety of bleeding disorders from thrombocytopenia, von Willebrand's disease, hemophilias. Talk about current recommendations for women who have anticoagulation, say heart valves or other reasons. And then finally, look at what are the alternatives uh, to neuroaxial analgesia. So before I begin, um, one thing I wanted to look at was what is the rate of epidurals in the U.S. and how frequently are we placing these in obstetric patients? Okay. So um, looking through the literature, uh, the news, uh, you would get this impression that some hospitals have very high epidural rates, which some do, but is quite variable around the U.S. We have a 2012 headline out of Chicago with over 90% of women at certain hospitals in that area having epidurals. Same is true of New Jersey. Same is true of almost every state in certain areas. But there's a huge variety. Right? Looking at the US statistics, we see that um, it varies greatly uh, by race. We also see that it varies greatly by uh, area of the country. So this is actually 2008 data that was published in 2011. It looked at 27 states, and uh, overall US rate, as I said, is 61%, a little higher in first births. It ranges greatly from state to state. Kentucky seems to lead with about 72% of uh, laboring women having epidurals, and New Mexico is lower at 22%. California is somewhere in the middle at about 40, and again, um, quite variable. It turns out education level uh, plays a role. Uh, the more education you've had, the more likely you are to have an epidural. Whether you have a midwife or an obstetrician taking care of you, slightly higher rate uh, with the obstetricians. If we look more internationally, we also see a variety of rates. Um, Canada is around 55%. Um, we see Great Britain at 25%, uh, Netherlands around 30 and you can imagine uh, the variability we see globally. Okay. So current contraindications to epidurals, there's a whole variety that you're familiar with. The one we're going to concentrate on this talk is just coagulopathy. Okay. So <clears throat> before we go into the uh, bleeding disorders, just a brief review of the coagulation changes of pregnancy. You have a variety of elevated factors from factor 7, uh, 8, 10, and 12, fibrinogen. Uh, other factors remain unchanged. Um, because of this, markers of coagulation, PT and PTT, are slightly decreased, as you know. Antithrombin 3 can be down. So for all these reasons, um, a couple of things happen. Obviously, we have an increased rate of DVTs and PEs, and additionally, because some of these factors are elevated, they greatly affect uh, the changes uh, of these bleeding disorders like von Willebrand's or hemophilia in pregnancy. We're going to start with thrombocytopenia. There's a great variety of causes of thrombocytopenia. You have pregnancy related in the left column, other causes in the right. The nice thing is you really don't need to know all of these. It turns out if we look at gestational thrombocytopenia, it causes about 70 or 75% of the pregnancy-related cases that you're going to see. Preeclampsia comes in at about 20% of what you're going to see. And then ITP uh, has another 3%. So if you're familiar with these three, that's about 95% of the thrombocytopenia that you're going to encounter. So starting with gestational thrombocytopenia, it affects a fair number of pregnancies, 5 to 8%. Typically, Platelet counts remain above 70,000. It's normally not seen in these individuals when they're not pregnant. Typically, it's found towards the third trimester. The other benefit is over two-thirds of the cases, the platelets remain above 130,000 and are really not an issue. How is it treated? Normally, we don't need to do anything because the platelets remain high enough. Occasionally, we can give a brief course of corticosteroids. ITP, a little bit more rare. Um, the problem with this is it's very difficult to distinguish it from gestational thrombocytopenia. 
Some things that can tip you off are as it normally occurs in the uh, first trimester. It's often associated with being present uh, when the patient's not pregnant. It's a combination of insufficient production by the megakaryocytes as well as increased destruction. Unlike gestational thrombocytopenia, uh, you can have problems with the neonate. You can have low platelets in the child also, and in one to two percent of these cases, you can have intracranial hemorrhage. So it's much more worrisome than the gestational thrombocytopenia. Um, <clears throat> it's diagnosed uh, with a variety of studies uh, in conjunction with hematology. Typically, these platelet counts are much lower, below 70,000. Uh, glucocorticoids are the first-line treatment. However, if that doesn't work, uh, IVIG can be given for a few days, uh, raising the platelet count. But unfortunately, it's transient. And each time this is given, the effect is a little bit less. In patients that are refractory to this type of treatment, um, they can give anti-RHD. What they do for uh, RH-positive patients with this disorder is they take pooled plasma from RH-negative individuals. The antibodies that are in there bind to the red cells, and this sort of um, overwhelms the spleen, and it concentrates on taking up the red cells rather than the platelets. So it can be uh, effective in cases that are resistant to IVIG. And then finally, for refractory cases, uh, splenectomy is in order. But obviously, it's quite rare that you get to that. OK. So <clears throat> with low platelets, the question we always come up with is, should we do the neuroaxial blockade or not? And as you know, we don't have a strict number uh, that the ASA puts out. Uh, this is still the most recent survey that I could find. Um, questions of both academic and private practice individuals as to would they be willing to place an epidural in an otherwise healthy pregnant patient with the following platelet count. You can see over 100,000, the majority would. 80 to 100, uh, a few uh, would rather not. And then once it gets lower, uh, the majority uh, would not. I feel that uh, this is probably the case today. I feel most practitioners and most recommendations say above 80,000, it's probably OK if things aren't changing. But that's really the big question is, what's the underlying process? And that's sort of the point of this talk, is to get you familiar with what's going on. Now, why I have not touched on preeclampsia, even though that's very common, is you have a uh, lecture coming up tomorrow on preeclampsia, so I'm leaving that. Uh, to that individual, but as you know, in cases certainly of severe preeclampsia with thrombocytopenia, you can have rapidly falling platelets that start out above 100 and uh, later in the day uh, be down well below 80. Are there other tests we can do uh, to get a better handle on what's going on with the platelets than just the count? So we have TAG, we have Rotom. This afternoon you have an entire lecture on a point of care testing that's mainly going to be on those two topics. Okay. Where are we with that? Um, a lot of centers do use it. I think it does add some information. We don't have great studies right now on what we can do for that information. Where, where we are is really just looking at normal values in pregnant people and getting those uh, published. So uh, we have uh, values now for Rotom and TEG that have come out uh, in the past few years to give us normal values, and I think uh, coming in the future will be a better understanding of what we might want to do with the added information of TAG and Rotom. So again, no published evidence on specific platelet counts that you would want to use. I think whenever you have a patient with significant thrombocytopenia, instead what it should do is make you think, what else is going on? What's the bleeding history? Why are they bleeding? What's the disease process behind it? Are they on anything else uh, medication-wise? Um, disease processes like preeclampsia affects the platelet quality. Um, are they in DIC? Is it a consumptive process? And then really sitting down with the mother and having a very frank discussion about potential risks and benefits of the neuroaxial blockade, the other options that are available, and really taking each uh, case individual by individual and making your decision. Von Willebrand's disease, um, very common uh, hereditary disorder. Almost one in 100 patients still uh, that you'll find uh, undiagnosed. So this will come up where they will have uh, abnormal bleeding and not carry this diagnosis. 
There are a variety of types of von Willebrand's disease, as you know. So these patients are going to be cared for in conjunction uh, with hematology. They will do a variety of tests on von Willebrand antigens, aristocetin cofactors, to determine what type of von Willebrand's it is. We're not going to go through each type, just the general knowledge that there are a variety of types, and each one uh, will have a different response to certain treatments. So for type 1, DDABP works quite well. Um, a lot of times in pregnancy, uh, because certain factors are up, like we talked about, you may not even need to give uh, DDABP. If you do, typically we give it about 30 minutes prior to the procedure, uh, neuroaxial block or the cesarean section. This peaks 30 to 90 minutes after it's given. It lasts less than 12 hours, so repeated doses are often necessary. The goal is to really maintain uh, the von Willebrand's factor and Ristocetin cofactor uh, greater than 50 international units. So uh, studies are often drawn by hematology in the peripartum period. Types 2 and 3, uh, although 2A is um, responsive to DDABP, uh, the other types typically are not. So uh, it won't do you any good, and you need to use um, von Willebrand factor concentrate. They'd have repeated doses, again, multiple times during the day. And the things that have really changed over time are we used to go to cryoprecipitate initially. Uh, but that's really the last line treatment nowadays for these uh, disorders. Hemophilias, these are X-linked recessive traits, so women are typically our carriers. Um, in pregnancy, because these factor levels are increased, it's usually not an issue, but they should be followed by hematology, and in cases where it is low, recombinant factors are given. So, um, what about anticoagulation with heparin, with Lovenox? There's a variety of reasons people might be treated uh, in the uh, peripartum period. In pregnancy, you have a venous thromboembolism history, people with uh, heart issues, uh, mechanical valves, and then in some cases of uh, protein uh, C and S, uh, factor V Leiden deficiency, uh, they may be on anticoagulation to help pregnancy loss. So the first thing is you want to know why they're on uh, the anticoagulation. And you want to know uh, exactly what is being done. Uh, when the word prophylaxis is used, it can mean a lot of different things in pregnancy. In the non-pregnant patient uh, with unfractionated heparin, we typically think about 5,000 units BID. But in pregnancy, those are often increased. 7,500 BID in the second trimester, 10,000 units BID in the third trimester if they're on unfractionated heparin. You want to know if the Lovenox is prophylactic or therapeutic. And all these um, <clears throat> will influence your decision. There are new guidelines uh, that have come out by ASRA in 2010. We'll go over. And uh, just for general knowledge, uh, you know, rates of spinal hematoma are exceedingly rare. But obviously, if patients are on anticoagulants, these are probably increased. We don't really know uh, the true rates uh, because they're so rare. And this is, of course, what we're trying to avoid. You have the spinal hematoma at about L1 to L3. OK, so what I've done on the next two slides is combined uh, recommendations from the US, Europe, and the Nordic recommendations. These all came out in 2010. So the US is in the uh, left-hand column with Europe and the Nordic for comparison. So sub-Q, unfractionated heparin, as long as you're 5,000 BID, meaning 10,000 less total dose for the day, um, you can basically place the neuroaxial blockade uh, whenever. If they're on IV heparin, the dosing uh, recommendations uh, that have changed are that you you, after you turn it off in two to four hours, you really need to have a documented PTT or ACT prior to proceeding uh, with neuroaxial block. Low molecular weight, 10 to 12 hours. If they're on prophylactic dosing, uh, that would be 30 BID or 40 Q day. And if they're on therapeutic dosing, you need to wait a full day uh, since their last dose. Okay. No issues with aspirin. Other antiplatelet drugs are uh, quite a bit longer. Typically, women are not on warfarin um, at the, uh, in this stage, but I put the guidelines up there also. 
What about after the anticoagulation? I mean, um, what, after, what about after uh, the neuroaxial block or the catheter is withdrawn? How long do you need to wait before restarting the anticoagulation? So um, sub-Q heparin, again, uh, as long as it's within those guidelines of 5,000 BID or less, uh, you don't. IV heparin, about an hour. You can see with low molecular weight heparin, it uh, varies whether you placed a block or you withdrew a catheter, slightly greater if it was a block placement um, for both uh, prophylactic and treatment doses of low molecular weight heparin. Okay. So you have this patient um, who is not suitable for an epidural. You've determined that either because of underlying disease process of low platelets or coagulation disorder or the fact that they're on heparin, you don't want to do a neuroaxial blockade. So what are the options? <clears throat> so first let's just look at what we're very familiar with, giving uh, systemic fentanyl. Uh, a lot of the data in the past have been done uh, by Dr. Rayburn. Um, so uh, this was a study uh, where they compared uh, Demerol um, and fentanyl. In the first stage of labor, you have some pain scores there on a 0 to 10 scale, and you can see that initially uh, with the dosing, uh, the pain scores are increasing as the dilation increases. Does not seem to be uh, you know, a tremendous amount of effect later on in the first, in the first stage. And um, as you know from using this, it can be less and less effective as the labor progresses. Nitrous oxide, um, available in just a few centers in the US. UCSF happens to be one of them. This is also quite variable. Approximately 10% of patients when we use this have a very good pain relief, but uh, almost 30% state that they have slight or none. The way we deliver this is um, you can, uh, we happen to have it piped into uh, all of our labor rooms and we have a uh, mobile regulator that we can hook up to the wall. We deliver 50% nitrous and 50% oxygen by uh, face mask. Uh, the delivery is controlled by the patient, uh, creating a negative pressure in the face mask. And uh, these are also available with e-cylinders that connect to them and can be rolled around to the labor rooms. Uh, again, for some patients, I think it works very well. Um, for others, uh, maybe not so much. The best way uh, to have it delivered, uh, we feel, is to have the patient start breathing it at least 30 minutes or more before their contraction. Uh, it takes probably uh, eight breaths, almost uh, 45 seconds for it to really come on board. And then um, that's when they begin to feel a little bit of the analgesia. We obviously have much better luck with patients that have come to us specifically because they know we have nitrous. Uh, they're fairly motivated for this analgesic technique. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a study out of Finland in the 90s comparing uh, some other methods of labor analgesia to epidural anesthesia. You can see water blocks on the left. We'll talk about after this slide. Nitrous, uh, Demerol, uh, paracervical blocks and epidural blocks. Uh, they had the patient give a pain score prior to the type of analgesia and then took a pain score right after it had been instituted and uh, understand that the labor is progressing. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of the pain scores going up uh, with some of these other options. As a matter of fact, the only one that it substantially goes down in in this study is with the epidural analgesia. So water blocks, nitrous, uh, Demerol, uh, paracervical blocks, um, not significantly different. Okay. There's a study done uh, in uh, 2002. Uh, it was repeated again in 2006 with similar results. This is called the Listening to Mothers Survey. Um, they did something novel. They took um, a little over 1,000 women, called them up uh, within six months of their delivery, and asked them what did they use, how would they rate it, was it helpful, these are ordered in most helpful to least helpful. The rows with gray are uh, the pharmacologic options uh, that you're more familiar with. So again, we see epidural at the top, rated as the most helpful by these individuals. There's other methods, uh, tub immersion shower, birthing ball, 
that were actually rated better than nitrous, rated better than the systemic opioids. The, the interesting thing on this is if you look in the most left column, the percent using, you can see that although, again, similar to our 2008 data, about 63% were using epidurals, if we go way to the bottom, breathing and position change, which are taught the most in the classes, um, were also most frequently used and also rated as the least helpful uh, by these individuals. Okay. So just some uh, other techniques, sterile water injections. This is not something we routinely do, but every now and then we have a patient who requests them. These are 0.1 milliliter injections of sterile water given intradermally in four points on the back. They turn out to be quite painful. I think that it's almost a distractor from the labor pain. And um, there was a Cochrane review on, done on this in 2012. Um, there were about seven studies. Again, outcomes reported severely uh, limited conclusions in clinical practice. No robust evidence that's effective for the low back pain of labor or any other type of labor pain. Okay. How about hypnosis? This is 2012 also, a very nice randomized controlled trial out of Denmark. They have uh, three groups. One group uh, underwent uh, three one-hour sessions of hypnosis training. Another group went, uh, underwent three one-hour sessions of just relaxation techniques. And then they had a control group. And their outcomes were what patients needed epidurals. Um, and they really found no differences in epidural use uh, amongst these groups. They did say, though, before we completely disregard hypnosis as a technique, maybe there are subsets of pregnant women that would uh, benefit more. OK. So we've got systemic opioids you're familiar with. We've got nitrous, hypnosis. Um, to be honest, acupuncture didn't fare much uh, better than these either. Water injections. What? What can we really do for these women that can't have neuroaxial blockade? Okay? What, what's going to be the most effective? So that's the next talk, uh, which is on remifentanil. See if it's a viable option or not. Mm -hmm.